Turn to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 21. Tonight we're going to see how God spreads his word far and wide and wants to make sure the most amount of people get to hear it. Proverbs 121 <clears throat> says that she crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying. And then we'll get to verse 22 yet tonight as well. This is an elaboration on the previous verse in verse 20, where it says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. So here, wisdom cries in the chief place of concourse. She doesn't pick Ray County dirt roads to do it. <clears throat> she doesn't pick the middle of nowhere to do it. But she picks the busiest of the streets to do it. The chief place of concourse. Chief is defined as, when it's speaking of things, which is the primary definition, it is highest in rank, capital, head. So the chief streets, the chief places, would be the ones that are the highest in rank, like the capital city, <clears throat> um, the place where um, all the people are. And that's what the word concourse means. Concourse is the running or flocking together of people, the condition or state of being so gathered together. So when you speak of concourse, you speak of a bunch of people getting together, and when you talk about the chief place of concourse, this would be the place where the most amount of people get together. Right? <clears throat> and this is where wisdom utters her words. So, in other words, she's uttering her words in the midst of big crowds, figuratively speaking, or literally, could be too, to be heard by the greatest amount of people as possible. And so this tells us that God doesn't just, he doesn't want to hide his uh, word under a bushel, just like he tells us that we're supposed to proclaim it on the housetops to let our light shine, and God's word uh, is the same way. And because of this, then nobody can find fault with God, saying someday that, well, I didn't know. I didn't hear it. Because the Bible says in Acts 17, in verse 30, that maybe they could have, you know, <laughs> prior to the coming of Christ, I suppose some of the, the other nations could have used some excuse that I didn't hear, and maybe they didn't hear the preached gospel like people hear it today, but I'll still show you how they did hear something anyway. But in Acts 17, in verse 30, it says, in the, in the times of this ignorance, that is, whenever God allowed all nations to walk in their own ways, at the, times of the, uh, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, means he closed his eyes, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So the, the call of the gospel is universal. It goes out to all men everywhere. Now the effectual call by the voice of Jesus Christ that gives men eternal life, that is a particular call. That's a specific call to specific people. But the gospel is general. And that's why we should share the faith with anybody we have opportunity and then the nature of that person will be revealed by their reaction to that message. And those that respond positively to it, then you can see that this is one of God's children. And those that respond negatively, you see evidence that they're not one of God's children. And that's, you know, people always say about when we believe in election, they say, well, what's the point of evangelism? You know, why even preach the gospel? Well, to, you preach the gospel to locate and educate the regenerate. Right? That's because we don't know who the elect are, so we just share it with anybody and everybody, and we let the gospel sort them out. <clears throat> and not only does God's word cry in the streets, but it also cries from the earth itself, and it cries from the heavens. If you just look over a couple of pages to the right in Romans 1 and verse 20, <clears throat> this tells us, the familiar verse to us, tells us that, that the creation itself screams out from all over the earth. It says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So even people prior to the cross, even people out in some Amazonian rainforest that have never heard a preacher, they still don't have an excuse because they still have a rational faculty to look around and see this creation around them and conclude that there must be a creator. And then... Not only does the earth, but the heavens also. In Psalm 19, verse 1, it says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I believe that was a direct quote. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So all those stars up there are telling us a message. I think you can make, people have made somewhat of a, a case that the 
there is a, some sort of a gospel message in the stars with the names of the constellations and picturing the gospel with Virgo the Virgin and, you know, giving birth to this um, person that's going to rule with a rod of iron and so on. But even apart from that, the heavens still at least tell us that there is an orderly universe out there which demands that there is a God. And Paul quotes that verse in Psalm 19, in Romans 10, 18, and tells us that from that we can conclude that everybody has heard. And this goes right back to what Solomon is saying, that wisdom cries in the chief place of concourse. She cries so that everybody hears. Romans 10 and verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. And he's quoting there from Psalm 19, 4, a few verses later from the verse that, that we read. So, yes, men have no excuse. They have heard. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You made a comment about, like, Amazon made it and stuff. They have to realize they're a god. And I, and I agree with that. But what, what, what about what makes them learn what god they need to worship? Because, you know, they'll worship Mother Earth and all these gods because they're not taught that way. But right. And, and that's the purpose of the gospel. With just if all you can do is look at the creation, you're not going to learn very much about God. You learn his eternal power. So he's, he obviously predated the creation to in order to have created it. And he was extremely powerful to have created it. Uh, you could reason that out. But other than that, you wouldn't know much. And um, I had another thought there. Oh, I just lost it. I hate it when that happens. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. Right, and that's, kind of, that's what Paul was dealing with there in Acts 17, because he says in Acts 17, 23, where he said that he, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, just prior to that, he's talking to people that were heathens, that hadn't heard the gospel before, kind of like the people in the Amazon, more cultured, more educated than the people in the Amazon. But he says in verse 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So they had gods many, and the Romans did, and they were ignorantly, like without knowledge, worshiping the true God. They made an altar to him, to the unknown God, to the one that they didn't know, in case they'd left any out. And Paul says, This unknown God that you don't know, you have been worshiping, but in ignorance. And that's the purpose of the gospel, is to tell them about that God. So I, I think God does require of us whatever we, we have. And so I, I could imagine a situation where if you did have somebody in the Amazon that had never heard the gospel before, but he looks and he sees there must be a God and just does the best that he can to say there must be a God, there must only be one, and he must be all-powerful, and I'm going to try my best to make him happy or whatever. And and I, I suppose God would be pleased with that to that extent and maybe send that guy a preacher or something somehow, you know, somehow send him his word, I suppose. Okay. <clears throat> Except it according to that a man it hath, and not, not according to they hath not. not. Yeah, that's in um, <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 8, I think. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 8.12. For if the first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. So yes, I, I would say that God has mercy in those situations. So then this, the verse goes on to say that wisdom cries in the opening of the gates and in the city. So the gates in those days, you had walled cities, and the gates were the entryway into the city, and we read about that in Proverbs Chapter 8, verse 3. Proverbs 8, 3. Well, and really, I, I don't want to spend the whole night on it, but in Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about the people that had the law of God written in their hearts, that they didn't, they didn't have the written revelation of God, but they had the law of God written in their hearts. This kind of goes to what I was saying in Romans chapter 2. 2.14 said, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, 
these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So these are Gentiles here that didn't have the law, like prior to, the, prior to Christ's coming, the law of Moses wasn't given to the Gentiles, and yet some of them were doing by nature the things contained in the law because they had God's law written in their hearts through regeneration. So same thing with the people in the Amazon. You could have people there that are God's elect. I'm sure there are. They're his elect out of every nation with the law written on their heart and doing their best, I suppose, with their limited knowledge and whatever their conscience is pricking them and, and goading them into doing. Um, in that case, you know, it's accepted according to they have, not what they have not. And God willing, they'll hear the truth somehow. Uh, Proverbs 8 and verse 3. <clears throat> so the gates are the entry of the city. So she crieth at the gates, this is wisdom, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. So that defines what the gates are. And so if you think about it, a gate would have been like a bottleneck where all the people are coming in through. So if you wanted to get to talk to the most amount of people, you would go to the entry. If you go to the middle of the city, you're not going to see as many people because they're going to be dispersed all over. But when you go to the bottleneck, then you get to talk to the most amount. And that's where wisdom chooses to utter her words because it's the most efficient place to utter them. And the gate of the city is also the place where the elders of the land um, gave judgment. They assembled together kind of like a city hall um, type of place. I've got a couple of verses here which will show you that in Deuteronomy 22 and verse 15. <clears throat> and then when you think about it, this makes sense why wisdom cries here too because this is a, a needful place for wisdom. Uh, whenever you're doing judgment, uh, that requires wisdom. So this is another place where wisdom cries. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 15. It says, Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. This is whenever the, the man married a wife and then claimed that she wasn't a virgin, and this is what they would do to, to prove that she was. But all that I wanted from that text was that they would go to the elders of the city in the gate. So the gate was the entryway, but, and I don't know if the if the place of judgment was right next to the entryway of the city, and that's why it was called the gate, because it, it is kind of a strange name if you think about it, like a courthouse or a city hall to call it the gate. But I'm guessing maybe it was right at the entry, and that's why it had the same name, but I don't really know why it has that name. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you another verse, though. Proverbs 31 and verse 23. Proverbs 31 23, speaking of the virtuous woman, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. So once again, the place where the elders sat and um, like political office, that kind of thing was called the gates. And I'll give you one more. Amos 5, 12, and 15. <clears throat> Amos 5, 12, and 15. It says, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. See, these are judges taking bribes, and they do so in the gate, right, in the place of judgment. In verse 15, Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate, that it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So if there's ever a place where the cry of wisdom is needed, it is in the places of judgment. And you think about this in our own time, in our own day, the Supreme Court. If there's ever a place where somebody needs to preach some good, sound wisdom and judgment and justice, it would be to the Supreme Court. With rulings being handed down like gay marriage and Obamacare forcing Americans to buy health insurance, and then do you hear about the latest one? I don't know if this is a, I, this wasn't the Supreme Court yet. I think it was another court, which it'll probably go to the Supreme Court. Women now are uh, going to be drafted or could be drafted into the military. These idiot feminists want equal rights 
for everybody. So yeah, now, yeah. now they get what they want. They don't want <clears throat> Stupid. Well, the would be for a woman to get drafted who was not a part of that movement. Or oh, yeah. Or oh, that's the thing, yeah. And probably the majority of women aren't in that movement. I think everybody's been affected by feminism, but the majority of women are not these hardcore lunatics out there, thankfully. And, but, yeah, women are now... It, and it's unconstitutional for women not to be drafted, for men to be drafted and not to be drafted. It's so funny, these people, it's like they never, they never step back and consider the, real, the fundamental problem. The draft is unconstitutional. It doesn't matter if they draft men or women or whoever. The draft itself is slavery. You ever think about that? They're basically forcing you to do work for the government. That's called slavery. Whenever you're forced to work against your will, that's slavery. And I'm, it's not just me saying it. Daniel Webster and the early, the founding fathers were vehemently against the draft. It's ridiculous. The courts are often corrupt, which Solomon knew firsthand, and he lamented. <clears throat> Hence the reason why wisdom cries in the gates. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 16. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 16. The thing is with the draft, if you had a legitimate war where we were defending our own homeland, you don't need a draft because everybody's going to fight, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a war where you need a draft, you shouldn't be in that war. If you have to, if you have to bring people, if you have to kidnap people and force them to be slaves to fight a war, you shouldn't be fighting that war, obviously. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 16. And moreover, I saw under the, place, under the sun the place of judgment that wickedness was there and the place of righteousness that iniquity was there. So there's nothing new under the sun. The, the courts have always been corrupt, at least during period, certain seasons anyway. And Scripture teaches in 2 Samuel 23 and verse 3 that in order for a man to be a just ruler, he's got to rule in the fear of God, which requires that he is taught the wisdom of God. That's why God sends his wisdom into the gates. First, uh, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 3. This is David speaking. He says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. But you can't rule in the fear of God, and you can't be, have justice if you don't first have wisdom. Because in order to have justice, in order for princes to decree justice, they must do so by wisdom. Proverbs 8, 15, and 16. <clears throat> Proverbs 8, <clears throat> 15, and 16. By me, remember this is wisdom speaking in Proverbs 8, by me kings reign and princes decree justice, by me princes rule and nobles even all the judges of the earth. <clears throat> so if, if our Supreme Court judges and lower judges would read the book of Proverbs every day, they'd probably hand down some better decisions than they do. The problem is, it's weird. It, the, the Supreme Court is not at all representative of the religion of the country because I, I forget the stats but most of them are either Roman Catholics or um, there's some Jews I believe so yeah and, and a lot of Roman Catholics very few pro probably no Baptists but very few Protestants even on the Supreme Court which is strange because there's way more Protestants than Catholics in this country it's so I don't I don't know why that well, is but the president yeah that's Even true Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was a Baptist. <laughs> so it was Baptist, quote unquote, supposedly. Well, not really, though, because Kennedy was the first Roman Catholic. That we are the only, yeah. The only Roman Catholic. Yeah, that's the weird thing, and and there, none of them have been Jewish. So, but the Jew, I mean, the Jews obviously have all the power and they have all the influence, and so, and the Roman Catholic Church obviously has a lot of influence. In this country too, but yeah, it's interesting. Although some of the the judges that were Catholics, like Scalia, he was a pretty good judge, and he was a Catholic, so his Catholicism didn't 
didn't adversely affect him too bad, I guess. And the, the latest guy, um, Kavanaugh, he's Catholic, I do believe. I'm pretty sure he's Catholic. Went to a Catholic. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm certain of it. <clears throat> I don't think he's all that great of a guy from what I've heard. But Anyway. So, <clears throat> because wisdom cries in the, uh, in the streets, in the chief place of concourse, then therefore judges or the judged are not going to be able to plead ignorance in the day of God's judgment because wisdom certainly cried to them. They can't say that they didn't know. And this is one of the reasons why in the past I liked going to these uh, meetup groups where I debated with atheists because I thought if nothing else, I have taken away their excuse where they can't say I didn't know. You know, and it was always interesting because they, they knew enough about fake Christianity to know that God loves everybody and wants to save everybody and blah, blah, blah. And it was always fun because they, they would bring that stuff up. Well, how can a loving God send somebody to hell? Like, he didn't love everybody. And then they don't know what to say. <laughs> he didn't love people he sends to hell. And then they're just totally, you know, they, they don't know what to say to that. So anyway, they have no excuse. There's a couple of those guys. One really hard-hearted rebel that I used to know up there in Minnesota went to that meetup group. And that guy, someday on Judgment Day, he is not going to be able to say he didn't know because he heard the true gospel and flat out rejected it and made fun of it. So he's not going to be able to say I didn't know. <clears throat> and just for a silly thing, if you are looking for a place to preach the gospel, you could follow this verse and do so in the airport because it says that wisdom crieth in the chief place of concourse and in the openings of the gates. Right? Yeah. So there you go. You could... Yeah. Yeah. 